Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, it's great to see so many people on the call today. Um, my name is Hannah Bartram, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for ADEPT, which is the body that represents local authority directors of place from across England. Um, so they are the directors responsible for commissioning many of the day-to-day -day services delivered by councils, including local highways, recycling, waste and planning. But we're delighted to be co-hosting today's webinar with SIPFA, not least because it is the only UK professional accountancy body to specialise in public services. Um, and this is actually the second in a, in a series of joint webinars aimed at place and finance directors and their teams with more planned in the future. So turning to today, the theme for today's webinar is sustainable procurement for places. And in particular, how can we harness the power of public procurement to meet the climate change challenge? So following its 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution, the government's recent green paper, Transforming Public Procurement, set out its ambition for smarter and innovative procurement to drive key outcomes, including tackling climate change. And so we believe that SIPFRA and ADEP can work together to help de develop the skills and capacity that local authorities need to help deliver green recovery through procurement. Um, before I introduce the speakers, just to some quick housekeeping. Um, so please do make full use of the, ch of the question box on the dashboard on the right hand side of your screen. Don't use the chat box, use the question box to pose any questions. Um, and if your question is aimed at a particular person, that'd be really helpful if you could Put the name against put their name against it um, the plan is to let all the speakers um, present as we've allowed plenty of time for q a at the end uh, and for information this session has been recorded and the it will be posted on youtube and that link will be sent to you very shortly along with the slide deck um, and if you do have any technical issues this is where you can use the chat box and somebody will look to try and help resolve the issue for you so turning to today's event, so we've got some great speakers lined up for you. So first up, can I introduce Mohammed Hans, who is a well-known procurement solicitor who manages the SIPFA Procurement and Commissioning Network, um, which also happens to be one of the biggest networks operated by SIPFA. I'm going to turn my camera off uh, and hand over to uh, Mohammed. So if you'll just give us one second while we do that. Mohammed, I hope you're there and I hope yeah. you are able to control the screen. There you go. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everybody's keeping well on a hot and sunny day. Um, in this session, I'm going to address how public bodies um, can work with suppliers to introduce new technology and specifications uh, to drive the market and to develop solutions to help tackle the causes and effects of climate change. There is no doubt that climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time. Just to give you kind of an, 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 analo an uh, analogy, many of you will have reviewed or advised on first major clauses in the past uh, when it came to including pandemics, independent what day of the week it was or what mood you were in. But over the last 12 months, everybody has paid a lot more attention to first major clauses as we grappled and, uh, and begged sometimes to get delivery of vital supplies. One thing is for certain now, we will never forget to include an incident of a pandemic in a force majeure clause. Similarly, with climate change, we've been talking about it for 20, 25 years in particular. Um, in the last 150 years, the con concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has skyrocketed, uh, particularly uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. We know that these gases accelerate climate change because they trap heat in the atmosphere, thus producing an increase in the Earth's uh, average uh, temperature. I mean, just yesterday, um, we had the highest recorded March temperature since 1968. These regular occurrences of extreme weather patterns is, is convincing in my view that this is not, not just an isolated or rare, in, rare occurrence. Climate change is at play here. The 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, report is an alarming reminder of the consequences of climate change and the urgent need to ensure that global temperatures do not exceed 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The report demonstrated that we are increasingly likely to miss our global warming target with the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature guardrail expected to be exceeded in just 11 years. Just quickly give a, a plug, we sit for doing a, uh, an online survey at the moment. 
and I've given you the links at the bottom of this particular screen here. Please do try to use this opportunity to uh, support this survey, which is in collaboration with a number of leading universities. Um, and SIPFA will also be doing, the procurement network will also be doing a much more detailed um, event on climate change later this year. So please do watch out for that. So in terms of this particular session, um, I'm going to have less than 500 seconds to give you a quick overview of sustainable procurement. So I'm going to explore the, uh, our understanding of what sustainable procurement is, uh, look at the drive for, for sustainable procurement, uh, give a few examples of what the public sector is already doing, and maybe consider a potential way forward. Some interesting data to start off with, 75% of local authorities have now signed up to the climate change declaration. And, and there are a number of private sector organizations who are also doing some similar declarations. Uh, and more than 50% have set uh, a goal of achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2030 or earlier. So some very good work that's ongoing at the moment and very commendable. However, the nature and magnitude of the problem that we all face uh, and that we need to solve will require a huge amount of effort on the part of everyone in the organization. Many of you will actually remember the Stern Review in 2006, which was a what, 700 page document. I actually read all 700 pages at the time. It marshaled evidence of costs and benefits and provided a massive leap forward in our understanding of the economics of climate change. However, there was no massive leap forward in actual, you know, what actually happened on the ground. Some of us had the opportunity to read the document, but there was not a huge amount of actually changes on the ground. A key point to remember is that actions um, the society takes today to address climate change, so things that procurement teams will be doing, it's not going to provide immediate benefits. Instead, those benefits will be reaped in the coming years and decades and even centuries in the form of fewer people dying from heat waves, cities not being submerged by uh, rising seas, uh, farmers uh, dealing with reduced risk of mega drought. So the payback time can be quite a long, long time to wait for. Procurement will be one of the most critical topics uh, for chief executives and chief financial officers in public bodies to help shape post-COVID strategy and success. Uh, procurement, which was once seen as the pariah or blocker with, within the organization, either looking to cut costs or impose unnecessary gateways, has suddenly become the key that unlocks critical supplies, goods and services. The role of procurement teams, especially over the last 12 months, um, in my view, has not been fully appreciated. I think we've done some fantastic work uh, to keep vital public services operating during very difficult and challenging times. With the approximate £285 billion pounds annual procurement spend uh, for the public sector, all public authorities have the power to use procurement to significantly contribute to the climate change agenda. In fact, procurement teams will be the main drivers to put corporate ob objectives into action. However, this is going to require significant upskilling and increasing your capacity. With the expected values of climate change related contracts, authorities will enter over the next several years. Doing it with your current resources could become a very costly exercise. We don't want to repeat the, 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 the wastage that we had with the massive number of outsourcing contracts in the past. Uh, it is also not just about carbon reductions, uh, but using the procurement spend to create better working environment. Uh, protecting the rights of workers and communities by purchasing supplies that have been procured in a socially responsible manner. There also needs to be a great deal more collaboration between the public sector and with other stakeholders to deliver real change, which is also affordable. So first, let me try and address what is sustainable procurement. This is a classic definition of what sustainable procurement is. Many of you will have probably come across this, a process whereby organizations meet their needs in a way that achieves value for money on a whole, whole life basis in terms of generating benefits to society and the economy whilst minimizing damage to the environment. Bit of a mouthful, uh, to be honest, uh, and not very appealing, but nevertheless very important. If you don't measure, you can't manage. And that maxim applies uh, forcefully to, to an organization's carbon emissions. I would encourage everybody uh, as a starting point to uh, look at, to break this down into more meaningful local data, establish your authority's own carbon footprint, uh, then link it with your own procurement spend and develop tailored plans after detailed market research. 
sustainable procurement is also about taking a long-term view, as I said earlier, in terms of the payback, the return on investment when it comes to working with partners in your supply chain and considering the effects on the people, planet and profit. Climate change objectives also need to be limited to obvious energy, do not be limited just to obvious energy and waste type contracts. Outcomes on a much more broader range of contracts can be delivered, for example, uh, where you have a consultancy contract, uh, they can be required to minimize travel through online meetings. We've all done online meetings over the last 12 months, so these things can be done, and this can actually help you reduce um, your carbon kind of uh, emissions levels. So why does it matter? Why should we adapt our spending habits? I've already mentioned uh, of the huge procurement spend, Studies have also showed that over the long term, sustainable procurement brings cost, cost savings and efficiencies to the organization. Supplier diversity alone, sourcing from suppliers owned and operated by people from uh, socially or economically disadvantaged groups has shown to substantially reduce purchasing costs. The Green Paper, which Hannah mentioned earlier, uh, promises a new national procurement policy statement. This will include uh, specific key outcomes on tackling climate change and reducing waste, which contracting authorities will be to some degree obliged to seek to address when carrying out major procurements. However, this policy statement has not yet been published. Once it appears, it may reinforce the drive to seek positive outcomes for, for the environment, which authorities should already be considered, considering as noted before. Additionally, the government has also published a procurement policy note 0620, taking account of social value in the award of central government contracts. Whilst the social value model introduced uh, in this note is clearly not mandated for sub-central contracting authorities, such as local authorities, they are still recommended to take note of it. And I would endorse this for a number of reasons. Now, I don't have time to go through this in detail, but one of the reasons is the fact that suppliers would already be working with central government departments. Um, and we'll have, we'll have updated the social value model and it may therefore become familiar with, with them over time. Uh, so local authorities are also encouraged to look at using this uh, PPN uh, in practice. The social value model also contains a number of useful guidance on evaluation metrics, which may be applied in assessing the climate change proposals of suppliers. In particular, it, it pr proposes a specific methodology for assessing and scoring bidders when responding to award related, uh, related to social value. The Sc Scottish uh, Procurement Directive have also published a, an SPPN uh, earlier in January on a, something very similar. Just, I think, just need to go back a few slides there. But as I said to you earlier, it's not just about um, it's not just about carbon. When you look at climate change, uh, if the whole world lived like uh, Western Europe, we would need three more planets to, uh, to sustain life. There's a number of inequalities which could be addressed through climate change agenda. 30% uh, of the UK population has a physical and mental disability. And these, this data is actually before COVID actually hit us. This number is probably likely to unfortunately go up uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, Communologists predict that street crime will rise with increasing temperatures. I don't need to go through all of these points. Everybody's aware in terms of what's actually happening out there. So the, the climate change agenda is very clear to everybody and it requires urgent action from every authority. In terms of driving, shaping, and working with the market, uh, all of the user considerations in market engagement are relevant here. Again, I don't have time to go through everything in detail, but in terms of early market engagement, if you signal your intention to pot potential providers early, making sure your ex um, existing suppliers know there will be an increased emphasis on climate change when contracts are retendered, uh, market testing, try to seek input uh, from existing and potential suppliers on proposed approaches, understanding their appetite, understanding what is possible to avoid either over-specifying or under-specifying, explore the potential to pilot innovation, innovative solutions, which are, which with care as usual to avoid uh, embedding them or prejudicing future competitions. Uh, collaboration is going to be very important. 
uh, working together with other public sector organizations as well as private sector and third sector organizations to really exert greater market influence over what you're trying to achieve in terms of the climate change agenda. I'm going to go and ask you a few polls now. So I'm going to ask Hannah to launch the first poll. OK. There you go, I hope you can all see that. So the question is, has your authority signed up to the climate change declaration, which I mentioned earlier? And you can vote yes, no, or if you're not sure, if you tick the, the not sure voting button. So if you just quickly uh, use the voting buttons to, to respond to that particular question. Just give 10 more seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And if you could close that uh, and launch the findings. Excellent. We've had 55% of colleagues who actually uh, joined this webinar said their authority has actually signed uh, the, the climate change declaration. 43% uh, aren't sure. So hopefully after today's webinar, you can all go and check whether your authority has signed up and 2% have said that it hasn't signed up to the climate change declaration. So interesting findings. If you can launch the, second, the next poll, please. Apologies, Hi. Mohammed. I'm just trying to load it, and I here we go. Thank you for your pardon. There we go. Thank you, Anna. So the next question is: Has there been any progress since the, the declaration was signed? So those 55% of you who voted uh, yes that you have actually signed up to us, the climate change declaration. Has your authority actually done any further action uh, um, since the declaration has been signed? I know that it's been over the, the last 12 months have been a tricky time, but still some authorities have actually done some work. So here your options are some work you've done or little work or expect more to do not more to be done in the next 12 months uh but not or the fourth option is not sure what to do next so again i'll give you 10 more seconds to respond to this particular poll question 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 if we close the poll Hannah, please and launch the findings again interesting uh Poll results, 43% uh, of you have said that there has been some uh, work, some initiatives since the declaration has been signed. So very commendable to all of you, especially over the last 12 months when you've been very busy with other things. Uh, but interestingly, 36% of you expect more to be done in the next 12 months. Uh, and 12% of you say, have said that you're not sure what to do next. Well, you'll have my contact details and other speakers contact details at the end so please do contact us if you need some further guidance so many thanks Hannah if you could close that poll down so I'm just going to quickly wrap up my session uh, so in, in terms of sustainable there's a lot of perceptions and reality um, in, in my view um, from a legal procurement perspective the first point to to, to make uh, clear is that whilst the proposals in a green paper, uh, if they are actually enacted, will bring many changes to public procurement, they will not in themselves radically change or increase the options a con contracting authority has when it comes to considering climate change and, and related environmental issues in their procurement activity. This is actually not bad news uh, and it's not meant to actually imply that there's nothing that we can do. Quite the contrary, considering climate change and seeking actions to, to mitigate uh, climate change and deliver uh, positive environmental outcomes is already permitted and supported by the current regulations uh, and other relevant legislation. So we, for example, have Regulation 67.2 of the Public Contract Regulation, which already provides that environmental and social con consideration can be used as award criteria. We've also got the Public Service Social Value Act, which requires authorities to consider the environmental impacts on any above threshold procurement. So there's a lot that we can already do in terms of um, procurement and introducing kind of climate change issues with our procurement activities. There's a huge role that technology will also play in terms of uh, supporting authorities 
I mentioned to you earlier that the, the Stern report, since the Stern report, so much development has actually taken place, which will actually facilitate uh, better implementation of climate change actions. Very, very quickly, because I'm mindful of the time, um, what everybody needs to be aware of is there are three different types of scopes of where the different emissions come from. Now, most of you will be doing a lot of work in terms of controlling scope one and scope two, which is what you can control yourself. But there's also a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of scope three. This is where contact management, early market engagement really comes into play. And we, we, know, we all know in terms of public sector, you know, we do suffer from the let and forget syndrome. There's a huge amount of work, a huge amount of benefits that can be gained if, if authorities actually engage with suppliers. Because there's going to be a lot of things that suppliers will do independently of the authority that you need to actually change to try to make sure that your procurement spend is actually delivering real outcomes. So one of the key messages which I would like to give today is you need to really engage with your suppliers uh, of all different sectors and try to make sure you bring them over. A lot of these major suppliers will already have their own carbon clim climate change policies. Work with them uh, to make a real change and a lot can be done. So in terms of my final kind of messages, uh, there's a lot that public authorities can do with uh, climate change. Um, corporate buyers should introduce environmental requirements into their purchasing. Uh, make sure you focus on, on, on scope three. And these are a couple of, uh, this is a particular slide which I actually did about 10, 12 years ago. If we do not act now, the struggle for food will drive animals to extinction and, and humans to despair. 14, 15 years since this particular slide was actually produced, you know, we've already seen the outcomes of what's actually happened over the last 12 months with this particular point. And, and the final point, in, in nursery school, we're taught to share, to cooperate and be nice to each other. And then in business school, we're taught to rip each other's throats out. There's some kind of disconnection here. So my point here is make sure you collaborate with both public and private sector to really make huge change in terms of climate change. And thank you for listening. And if you do have any questions, please do contact me. That's great. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, and please do remember uh, you can ask uh, questions using the question box. Um, right, moving on. So our next speaker is Carolyn McKenzie, who is the Director for Environment at Surrey County Council, and she's got over 20 years experience in the environment sector, so very well placed to take part today. She's going to describe um, the County Council's work on a green procurement strategy. Carolyn, I have given you control of the mouse, so you should be able to move the slides, but do let me know if you want me to do it for you. Are you there, Carolyn? Nothing yet, Hannah. Nothing yet, okay. Okay, do you want me to drive for you then? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. All right, there we go. Just say when next slide and I'll move it on. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, it feels very strange looking at my screen and looking at myself and not seeing you all, but it's nice that we've got so many um, attendees uh, on the call. When Hannah said about my experience, uh, I feel like I've been doing green procurement with various teams um, across the years for all of those 20 years and still haven't quite cracked it, but I think we're, we're getting there. Um, for me, the, the phrase green procurement doesn't quite, next slide, next click, Hannah? Uh, no. Yep. Uh, doesn't quite answer the question. Um, for me, it's very much about uh, everything we do. Uh, it's not just about what we buy, it's about all our services, how we commission, um, and, and everything we do as authorities. We need to be looking at through the lens of um, climate change, but also. Um, ecological emergency, circular economy, and the other environmental pressures. So it's um, it's quite a big task. Next slide, please, Hannah. Apologies, Paul, Carolyn. It's uh, it's frozen for me too at this moment. So uh, keep keep talking, and oh, there we go. That's okay. Um, so really, what that means is that what we're looking at with our sustainable procurement is is actually how we develop. Um, 
sustainable development really and they, I know that term went out of favour quite some time ago but actually the sustainable development framework and the goals are a really good framework in which to base um, procurement activity because it's about linking up um, with the other bits of your authority and external to your authority as well. Next slide please Hannah. Uh, the numbers were mentioned earlier on, and 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 this is why this is this is such an important area of work. is is the size of the prize. We spend as a public sector an awful lot of money, um, and that money can be used both to stop harm happening, but also to um, drive change uh, and drive positive outcomes. Uh, and we've been working with um, some of our councils um, across Surrey, uh, including Elmbridge, and with our suppliers Orbis and um, the LGA and the Design Council to look at how we can really embed uh, green procurement within our um, procurement processes. But just a word of warning that that's, that's absolutely fine and that should be within our procurement processes, but for procurement really to work effectively, we need to make sure that the strategies surrounding it, so for example, a um, local transport plan four or your economic strategy also need to have those links and hooks because then procurement can then link onto that. So it gives it a really good framework. Uh, next slide, Hannah. The next slide will we'll go into uh, just the partners we've got in the programme. So as I mentioned, the Design Council and the Local Government Association. Um, and the work that we're doing is over a six month period. So and we're really grateful um, to the help uh, of the design experts and also other colleagues working around this because it's a it's a really tough nut to crack. So we, we need to kind of get all the help you can get. And that's one bit of advice I'd say to everybody is is learn from others. Next slide, please, Hannah. Um, this I, I love this slide and I have to say I cannot take credit for this. This is my um, colleague uh, Nicole Klukas that put this together and this is what um, we're trying to achieve uh, in terms of a sustainable procurement policy, um, sporting documents, training and guidance and that's absolutely all fine and great um, but it's much much more than that. Uh, this is about basically changing a culture and behaviour of people right across the organisation, whether it's those directly in the procurement department, whether it's those that are doing the procurement or commissioning, whether it's decision makers or your members, this, this is a real culture shift. So as well as we need the tools, the procurement policy and the guidance documents, we need to really shift um, the way people think about things. And that procurement is not just about buying things, it's about delivering outcomes. And uh, next slide, please. I, I couldn't resist this, and, and I, I don't know, I, I'm not a major um, Star Trek fan, but it, the phrase um, kept going around in my head because it is a completely huge shift. Um, it is from buying that, uh, changing the way we procure so that we do use it much more strategically um, and, and use it to drive the market, use it to drive change. Uh, it's not just about social value clauses, although that's really uh, useful, and it's not just about sustainability checklists. Um, it is about that whole new approach. And for many people, that's going to be quite uncomfortable um, from across the piece. So the, there's going to be need to be a lot of um, bravery if we're going to avoid uh, any accusations of greenwash. Ne next slide, please, Anna. Just to say this, it's easy to say what it's not for me. Um, it's not just buying staples made from recycled metals or recycled paper um, or uh, energy from a green supplier. Um, it's not just having the checklist, I've said, and, and calculating, so I've bought that product and it's cost me this amount of carbon. Um, well, we will we'll have to do that, but it's not about just about that. Uh, and it's technology will absolutely play a part in this. But it's not the, the only solution to it, and it won't be the only solution to it, it'll need much more. <clears throat> and, and again, not procuring um, and not using things is absolutely 
a very important part, but it's not just about that. It is about linking all those policies and strategies together so that um, the economic policy delivers on environmental um, opportunities, the environment policy uh, delivers on social outcomes and health outcomes. So you're really looking at uh, how all the different policies um, work together. It's also about um, looking differently at how you deliver. We work with suppliers. What is a supplier? A business, a small business, a big business. Our suppliers are going to change. They might be a community group. It might be someone down the corridor who you're co-commissioning with. It might be joint ventures um, or setting up a CIC so that, that the whole way of delivering is going to change. And, and there is going to be that massive shift towards looking at things as services and not as products. So you continue to upgrade, but you don't have it, keep it, th throw it away. You have it, use it and return it and then get an upgraded service. Um, and, and the last one I think for me is, is absolutely key in the sense that it is about those people who say yes. So um, you guys who are in procurement or you guys who are in um, buying the services or our members to make the link. So if someone is, is doing a um, contract within place that's looking at a road scheme or looking at a building, they need to look above that and think, well, what else could I achieve with the money that I'm investing in this programme? So it is very much about making those links. Next slide, please, Anna. Okay, and it is a totally new way of working. And I'm sorry, my, my um, screen is, is not showing me <laughs> um, everything here. Yeah, so it's scary enough for us to work across budgets. Um, it's it's in, really incredibly scary Look at working with other organisations. And I put this in, especially for David who's coming on next, but working with the private sector and communities, um, I, I think that that's the, the kind of pinnacle of it. But all of that needs to be embraced if we are actually going to deliver the change we need, both on climate change, biodiversity, and other environmental um, problems, because there is no one silver bullet, there's no one pot of gold, and there's no one organisation. So we're going to have to share resources. Next slide, please, Hannah. Um, I don't expect you to take this slightly complicated um, diagram in, but what it's what it is it trying to say is that also it's not just about procurement, it's about the financing and the method that will pay for the things we buy. Um, gone are the days of having a really big revenue budget or a really, really big capital budget. We're going to have to look at how we bring those budgets together, like I've said, from across the organisation. And we're going to have to see who has money elsewhere, whether that's um, the community, the residents, businesses, government. And we're going to have to see how we bring that all together. And it might be through methods of crowdfunding or um, green bonds. Um, or whatever it is, it's a completely different way of looking at how we finance the procurement and commissioning we're trying to do, which, which as procurers and commissioners need to be very aware of. Next slide, please. Now, oh, yeah, now please forgive me for this diagram. Um, I wanted to put something in that illustrated how many links there are and how complicated the process can be but also how many opportunities um, there are. And, and I think Hannah, when she saw this diagram, was slightly worried about what I was going to say. And, and um, just, just in, before anyone actually put, puts their hand out and said, uh, hands up and said, I've spelled intelligent wrong, I know. Um, my husband has already pointed that out, but, I, but I'm dyslexic, which kind of gives you an idea of where I come to on this diagram. So if you're looking at a new road, we obviously, as an outcome, would like an intelligent highway that has absolutely no congestion or it's free flowing. Um, it doesn't flood or melt. It's in good condition. We don't have any potholes um, and it does more than one job. So street lights with um, air quality control or broadband or whatever it is that they're, they're looking to put on roads now. So that's what we want. But that costs an awful lot of money. So a, which a highways budget wouldn't necessarily have all that money within it. So if you look at where else that could link in. so. Something that's as um, whizzy as a new road with a smart highway is a really good opportunity for R&D, um, really good opportunity to test things out, to use money coming from universities to look at how we can create new markets that will then create jobs, which 
uh, has an economic growth impact, um, an impact hopefully on our, our um, council tax and adds into the funding pot and the rationale for doing it. We can look at apprentices and we can look at high level apprentices, which then starts to address those um, aspects of youth unemployment. Now I said youth unemployment here and, and it's also all aspects of employment because obviously apprentices can be at old age. But that then brings in the budgets of um, other departments within the council that can then start to look at funneling money into this for, for other outcomes. And then we have active travel. Obviously from a carbon perspective and air quality perspective, active travel is essential. So I'd be willing to purchase that from an environment director's point of view. Um, from a health point of view, it's great for our health and well-being and mental stability. So there's an impetus there. And then lastly, um, someone said to me the other day, well, all the money's in flooding. We've got a real approach around natural flood risk management. We can do that and we can use, <coughs> excuse me, rain gardens at the side of the road, natural flood risk management. That then encompasses trees, which looks at carbon, which brings in money, which looks at biodiversity net gain and biodiversity. And you can create a whole new habitat down the side of the road. Uh, so all of that kind of comes together to basically say we can do this differently and we can corral uh, more money. Next slide, please, Hannah. And just to give you some realised examples that are happening um, around this and where we're going to be testing the boundaries um, with our procurement. Uh, we're just about to embark on, or we're involved in the River Thames scheme, which is a 500 million um, scheme and uh, SDC, Surrey County Council are partners with uh, the Environment Agency, so we're putting in £230 million, pounds, but we're putting that in not just to get a flood scheme, we're putting that in to be able to create new green spaces, to link it up with our um, public rights of way network, to have somewhere to put trees for carbon sequestration, to do the biodiversity networks and nature recovery. So we're bringing that all together. The one in the middle is our Green Jump Surrey, which is our retrofit project using um, GH Lab money, if anybody knows what that is. But we're looking at tackling fuel poverty and we're looking at um, creating jobs by working with a local supply chain and working with local colleges around training and we're also looking at that to do carbon and it's almost like the carbon is the um, sideshow of the other benefits that come out of that on the bottom right hand side you, you can see um, uh, the beautiful woodland and we have a green prescribing project with our health um, authority and we're looking at how we can uh, do green prescribing, bring residents out into the countryside to tackle an, an, a number of health issues, which although the, the environment is free at the point of access, it also costs money. So working with public health, working with our health colleagues, we can start to co-fund um, our green spaces and our activities within green spaces, such as volunteering, to be able to do more for less and hopefully better. And the last two um, slides, oh, sorry, Hannah, can you go just one back very quickly? I'll be very quick. Um, on the bottom side is our new uh, headquarters, which has moved from Kingston uh, down into Rygate and Banstead, our Woodhatch uh, site. And we've got our office, we've got a school, we've got um, some extra care facilities, and we're using that, we'll be using that hopefully to test out a number of new techniques, ways of working, construction methods, um, landscaping, to really see what we can do with our public sector money so we can roll that out further on. Next slide, please, Hannah. Um, th this is the techie bit. You see, I, I just scribble on diagrams. Th this comes from the Design Council, and this is the really formal way of doing it and how you can link engagement with leadership and with different people's outcomes and challenges and really get a much better um, project. But I, I won't confess to, uh, to owning that diagram or, or, or that slide. Uh, next slide, please. So just to say where we are now, um, we have reviewed um, Karen, our- Carolyn, one, one minute if that's okay. Yeah, I'm absolutely there. We've reviewed Sorry. our procurement Sorry. processes, and we've engaged, started engaging with our suppliers, and we've got a draft of principles, um, and link started to, to look at how we link that to um, social value. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, almost the last slide. So what we've also done is we'll look at, we've got a specific sustainable procurement manager coming in post, but we've also started to have those difficult conversations with 
our capital board. So I've been to our capital board and I've gone through all the things that we need to fund and how we can put criteria into, into big projects that we've got to get different outcomes. So really some, some really hard uh, conversations. And my service, my, my Greener Future service within the environment is looking at outcome-based budgeting. And we are going to be a pilot for both outcome-based budgeting and outcome planning as well. And final slide, Hannah. So the, the, this was basically my thank you, my thank you to you as an audience, but also to my team, because the majority of the work is being done um, by others and by the team. So they're doing the heavy lifting, hence the elephant. Um, and, and I just get to sit on the top and get all the glory. But thank you very much for listening. That's great. Thank you, Carolyn. OK, moving swiftly on, uh, we, we are running a bit behind time, but we have got a bit of uh, leeway at the end. So we, uh, if it's OK with people, I'll run on a bit beyond three o'clock. So without further ado, can I introduce our final two speakers, uh, Neil Gibson and David Ogden. So Neil, Neil was a debt president, actually, in 2018-19, whilst he was placed director at Buckinghamshire County Council, as it was then, and is now an independent advisor and facilitator. Uh, and David is business director, Amy, and has worked across utilities, private and local government highway sectors. Uh, and they're going to talk about the concept of out-based commissioning and procurement. Neil, am I going to drive the slides for you? Would that be easier? Yes, please. OK. So you get to see me and my slides. Lucky people. <laughs> Um, okay, good afternoon. Um, so Hannah's giving you my credentials, um, so I'll go over that. This is one of the wicked issues for ADEPT. We've been uh, looking in several ways at how we can smart up our buying and purchasing of goods and services as an association um, to better affect some of the wicked issues we have uh, as place directors, socially, environmentally and economically. So whilst our focus today is on sustainable procurement with an environmental kind of climate lens, it's equally important we drive the right outcomes for our people, our communities, our businesses, our economy, as well as for the environment. That's the real tricky bit. And surprise, surprise, it's not easy. If it was easy, we'd be doing it already. Um, so what we introduce you today is to, is to build on the previous two speakers, actually, and give you a kind of strategic thought leadership perspective of one of the initiatives that we've been looking at through our Excellence in Place Leadership Programme. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. Uh, I think you've jumped to there. Hey, excellent. Um, so what is the Excellence in Place Leadership Programme? Um, in very simple terms, it's a joint venture between ADEPT and AMI. Um, we recruit a cohort of thought leaders from English place authorities, um, unitary or county councils, combined authorities, local enterprise partnerships around England. Uh, we bring them together in four sessions in a year and we ask them to give some thought leadership to four of the wicked issues in their sector, in their authorities. Uh, they choose the subjects, um, but then we bring some uh, disruptive thinkers in from uh, universities, internationally, the private sector, the public sector, the third sector, to help them think through those wicked issues. Um, we don't design solutions, you can't do that in a day, but what we hope to do is to stimulate a debate subsequently around how we need to change things and do things better moving forward. It's interesting, um, what I'm going to talk about today was the first session of the first cohort in 1920. So uh, although it's a good 12, 18 months on, we're still doing work around that particular theme. So the issues don't stop at the end of that one day session. And of the four sessions we looked at in 1920, three were broadly linked to the environment. We did a what do you mean plan. 2020, Neil? Just to clarify. Well, so, yes, sorry, thank you. 2019. <laughs> You're looking 2020. good if it was 1920, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I'm a trekkie. So, um, in that first year programme, we had this uh, on procurement, which includes sustainable procurement, green finance, and a master plan around zero planning in Gloucestershire. And in the co-op this year, which started in uh, uh, 2020, now in 2021, uh, our last session on um, Friday just gone, which includes Carolyn, actually, your previous speaker, has been looking at reimagining the role of nature conservation in zero carbon. So I 
I think the bottom line is out of all this is that the uh, as Mo uh, Mohammed was saying earlier on, the carbon agenda greenhouse gases is underlying the thinking of many of the people that drive place services in England at this present moment in time. Next slide, please. So, um, the way we look at this is we challenge ourselves around whether there is a better business model. Um, now, ADEPT and its commercial partners think that there is. And we describe it as a business model rather than a procurement model because we believe that building strong, practical, meaningful commercial relationships between the commercial sector that provides many of our services uh, and local councils, we regard it as a business model rather than just a procurement exercise with a strategic relationship that goes behind it. I mean, you will know, I've got some stats here from December 20, English local authorities spent 63 billion a billion of that in Surrey, from what we've just heard, uh, across English local councils. That's a shed load of money. And um, getting the full maximum leverage in that value is critical from an adept and commercial partner perspective. But it is hard. And as I think as Car Carolyn has already intimated, getting that strategic shift in thinking from where we are now to where we need to be um, is, is a cultural change. So we use the RPL program to test its thinking. Um, I'm just going to give you the highlights today, and if you want the detailed summary of the day, uh, it's on that website, which you'll get uh, when you get the slide deck uh, after today. Next slide, please. So that was the problem statement we tested uh, in this EIPL session. What does a great future business model look like? And describe the essential components of that new business relationship between the commissioner, the council typically, and the provider, and that could be either a private sector commercial provider or an internal public sector provider of services in terms of an internal solution. So this is a model that equally applies to internal as well as to externalizer services. What do you mean by place-based services? Um, that would be typically house maintenance, transport, environmental services such as waste, street cleansing, uh, parks, grounds maintenance, economic development, uh, and construction, which probably are the most, for most councils, are procured or commissioned from separate organisations over different time periods and with a mixed economy of internal and external service delivery. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the, these were the thought leaders. So we had uh, in 2019-20, uh, uh, 10 senior leaders at executive director or assistant director level, drawn from a range of councils, uh, including a local enterprise partnership across England. Uh, on that day, we had uh, Ferrovial, uh, Centre of Excellence in, we had the uh, some of the AMI team and the then chief executive AMI uh, as part of the events. We had the connected uh, places catapults, one of the 10 or so catapults from the country. Uh, and we had the cabinet-sponsored Go Lab from Oxford University that looks uh, does a lot of research on outcome-based commissioning, and a legal company, Bird and Bird, based in London that does a lot of work with uh, councils around procurement. Next slide, please. If you go to the summary, you'll be able to go through what we did in the day, including looking at breaks and blockages, what's stopping us getting to looking at excellence. Uh, one of the things that got overcome. But this, th these were the uh, three workshop groups at the end of the day, came up with three new business models. Um, and it does really kind of play to what uh, Carolyn was saying in the previous uh, presentation. So the first group, top left-hand side, um, led with a view that if we're going to go for zero carbon, zero neutral, tackling greenhouse gases, we had to take a, put that at the center of our thinking uh, and look at growth, landscape, transportation, waste assets, all those place-based services that drive through those procurements, through those commissioning into innovation, collaboration, and co-creation. Uh, uh, so that's collaboration, as, as Carolyn was saying, within departments. So, you know, getting an economist talking to an ecologist, talking to an engineer, to a, a QS, to a property person, uh, someone that deals with waste looking at collaborating internally, but importantly, collaborating with communities, 
the private sector, the third sector in a co-creation model, but they led with carbon neutral. The one on the bottom left-hand side led with the need for a place plan. How, how can you commission billions of pounds of the services without a clear understanding of your place with a clear vision, which then drove service design, innovation, and better outcomes? And the one on the right-hand side, similarly again, started with a partnership created place-based outcome strategy around health, environment, productivity, economics, and so on, which then became a platform upon which to uh, commission or procure individual services. So that was their view on what great looked like. Next slide, please. Behind the diagrams, though, there were some common themes uh, that was uh, common to all three models. Um, now this might sound like a JNC uh, health social care type approach, and no apologies for that, that did shape their thinking. So the common theme was the need for clear evidence place, a, a clear evidence base across place, across your locality, um, upon which you would then produce a plan driven by the evidence base, which then became a plan for commissioning. That would be co-produced with local stakeholders and business, and that would vary from locality to locality. Um, and that vision would drive and articulate very clear environmental, social, and economic outcomes for the place, the community, and the business within it, within which you could then scope and procure individual services that made a contribution towards achieving those strategic outcomes. Uh, I think, as Carolyn said also in her slide deck, making clear links with the commissioning plans of others, like economic plan through local enterprise partnerships, uh, street commissioning through health and social care, and so on. But that all would require a massive step change in collaboration, collection of evidence base and skills. The supposition being is that we don't have statutes for place like that upon which we condition, and we certainly don't have integrated evidence bases for place. We might have a transport database, an economic database, a, a green environmental base, a waste database, and so on. But how does all this aggregate together around a plan for place, and how does it aggregate to go together to, to, to the, demonstrate the role they can all play in the outcomes for that particular locality? Next slide, please. So following the workshop, we did some further work, uh, facilitated by Amy, uh, the Catapult and Go Lab. There were three workshops uh, last year. Um, and we hunted out three ADEPT members who were looking the closest we could find at the time to local authorities that were adapting this kind of um, place based strategy with outcome based commissioning across their places. And they're all SEs, funnily enough, South End, Somerset, and Staffordshire. And perhaps if we were doing this now, we might have added uh, Surrey on as well. So maybe it's something about the S. Next slide, please. So the Catapult haven't yet published their final report. It's due in a month or so. But here's some key insights uh, for, uh, from those three case studies, those three local authorities that are having a crack at this. The impetus for change has varied, um, but it's always been led from the top. It's typically been a drive from the leader of the council. Uh, or a new chief exec of a council, or some kind of financial crisis. So it's been one of those three things. But in all three authorities, it's been the CEO slash leader that's been the real driver for this approach. Um, the, the surprise, surprise, this is coming out through the case studies that a robust play strategy is needed to structure and focus the outcomes. Um, that in their view so far, outcome-based commissioning does actually improve collaboration between councils and suppliers, and therefore the citizens or the taxpayers benefit. So it is delivering some uh, outcomes, some benefits. That flexibility is beneficial in supplier management uh, and in the delivery, and, the, and in the measurement of the outcomes to maximize impact. But this flexibility needs to be embedded in contract and in contract governance uh, and not be too rigid. Um, and the conclusion on the insight so far is that whilst it's beneficial linked to procurement, the whole mechanisms of getting into outcome-based commissioning, I think as Mohammed was saying as well, is quite immature at the moment and less well-developed. So next slide, please. 
So just hang on to uh, David, who's going to kind of give a view on this from the private sector. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Neil. Um, I'm David Ogden, business director in, in Amy. And as Neil said, we work with Neil and the wider ADEPT team to deliver the EIPL program, which is really important for us because it brings together collective knowledge you know, as Neil said on today's wicked issues from both the public and private sector on, on those things that are impacting place-based services. And, you know, personally, I can't see any single organization or single authority being able to tackle these issues alone. And therefore, has been mentioned a number of times today already, collaboration is, is absolutely key in this period that we're we're entering into and I think the next 10 to 15 years is a, a really exciting time to come together things are aligned that haven't been aligned for many years to be able to get that momentum to move things forward but it will be challenging and, and hence why we need to do it in partnership and with that true collaboration uh, across uh, multiple directions to to tackle the issues that have been discussed today such as climate change, economic recovery, diversity skills, innovation, and of course, uh, financial resilience moving forward as well. And, and to form those partnerships and to set the wheels in motion to deliver in a collaborative way, obviously procurement has an important role to, to play in that and ensuring that we set up a partnership that enables that truly effective and transparent delivery of, of public services. But at the moment, uh, we're not seeing a significant use of outcome-based procurement, but it's not a new concept, um, that's for sure, but it's just not very prevalent within place-based services at this time. And there does, however, seem to be a bit of an underground movement happening. <laughs> and more people um, seem to be going in this direction. I personally had two experiences that I wanted to share with you on at different stages actually of, of relationships uh, on out -based, outcome based procurement and um, that have been very very enjoyable to be part of. One of those of which was Staffordshire which when I say this isn't new back in 2014 Staffordshire awarded a contract um, which was based on outcomes that the senior officers in Staffordshire, James Bailey, in Turner, Darrell Ayres, you know, procured back in 2012, 2013, and had that foresight to, to bring that into their highways contract. And I came into that whilst it was actually operating. So probably not until sort of 2015, 2016 time. And for me, just experiencing what's been developed there, it's, it's created a fantastic environment to work in, somewhere where the pride in the service runs through the whole team uh, and delivers for me what is truly you know, collaborative, innovative and transparent culture. And the second one I was gonna share with you is, is, a, is a much more recent one. And, and uh, Carolyn's on the call um, from Surrey today, it's actually Surrey's highways procurement that they're currently uh, embarked on. And again, have taken that outcome-based procurement approach. And, and for me, what that's doing, and it's been mentioned a couple of times there already, is it's really challenging the market to think differently and to drive thoughts outside of the individual service that's being procured to make you think about the outcomes across the whole of place. And that drives fostering relationships, you know, alliancing approaches within organizations that sit within the same directorate that you're being procured into potentially you know for example waste collection street lighting highways design activities those types of things it makes you think how collectively you are a piece in the puzzle that delivers the outcome and it creates that opportunity for collaboration and creates the mindset and the saying yes culture of of moving things forward but equally it makes you look at the service that you're um, potentially responsible for in a very different way as well it makes you challenge the things that you've always done Carolyn mentioned earlier and I couldn't agree more this is a big cultural shift 
to be thinking about outcomes and not outputs. We've been trained and brought up on, or I certainly have, you know, on, on outputs throughout my career. And that shift to outcomes, it's not easy, but it is really enjoyable to start thinking outside the box. And it does make you challenge those things, as I say, on the service that you're engaged upon, as well as thinking outside of how you can have that involvement and impact on the outcomes on the wider place-based activities. And for me, it's ultimately driving a, a closer alignment of uh, using sit for words, driving service, you know, for the better, for changing lives, making people think um, more holistically uh, than specifically looking at, at an output and thinking that that means we're doing a good job. So for me, it certainly feels like outcomes focus in place based services is the way to go. And as I mentioned at the outset, I've seen an alignment, and as I'm sure we all have, you know, from central government policy to local authority desire and ambition from the, the from the customer and public expectations, as well as then the public and private service providers desires to deliver in a in a different way. So for me, the time is right. And I think in the, if we've got time in the panel discussion is to perhaps challenge ourselves to think about why this approach isn't becoming more commonly adopted. And that's it from me, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and apologies, I lent on my machine by mistake. So I do apologize, the last slide disappeared. That was entirely my fault. Um, we are gonna bring all of the speakers together now. Um, I am going to turn my camera on and I'm hoping that Monica can bring the rest of you up on the screen as well. Um, and I will, uh, I can certainly see, oh there we go, you're all coming, marvellous. Brilliant, thank you very much and I hope you haven't, you're not on mute all of them. So we have had quite a few questions coming in so um, I'm conscious of time so we'll try and, we'll spend five to ten minutes on questions if that's okay. And what I hope we can do is after this is um, I can turn the questions around the panelists and hopefully they'll be able to provide some written responses. Um, so one of the questions I've had, which I hopefully um, if it will apply to more than one of the speakers, which was how much work has been undertaken to understand the impact requiring reader approaches on the costs of goods and services. So how much work has been undertaken to understand the impact requiring greener approaches on the costs of goods and services. Carolyn, is that something you're able to kick us off with? So, so basically, do we know how much more it's going to cost us um, to do this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how much more? How much work is? Yes, exactly. What are the yeah. What are the impacts behind well, and costs behind requiring greener approaches? Um, well, we we haven't done any specific work into that, but I, I've been given a brief that that pretty much we can't spend much more money than we're spending now. So, what, what we're um, hoping to do is is to make sure this is combined within uh, what we're already doing, uh, and and not have to expand the budget too much. I, I don't necessarily think it has to be more expensive if you're clever about how you design services and and look at how you procure. Um, but there may be some element of premium uh, for a little while. But I think as you find products and services developing in the same manner then costs will start to go down, but no specific work has been done um, on that as yet. Okay, Neil, you had your hand up. Is that something you wanted to add here? Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I, I guess I guess my pushback would be, so I entirely agree with Caroline, if this is gonna cost uh, council millions of billions more, that isn't gonna happen, is it? Okay. Um, I, guess, I guess my question is, how many councils have done their scope one, two, and three carbon impact assessments and truly understand the cost they're incurring on society and environment and remediation of the goods and services they're already buying. So if you buy a product that's, that comes from China and it costs 10 quid, actually the real cost of society is probably 30 quid. But, but no one bothers about that because A, you're not calculating it and it's not coming out of your budget, but someone's paying for it. Mm. So um, if you follow um, Carolyn's logic through, if you can purchase the same product in a different way that's more sustainable for, for, for £10, you're actually saving society £20. But it could be in China, it could be in Croatia, uh, it could be in um, you know, a port somewhere. You know, so um, the, the, 
so it's important that we do look at cash because money makes the world go around, but, but actually procurers have got to start from a full and intense and detailed competent knowledge of what their actual cost and spend is at the moment. Yeah, the bigger picture. No, I take your point. Mohammed, there's a really interesting question here, actually, which is how far do you think the Social Value Act can be used to leverage green benefits? Oh, that was an interesting question. What do you think about that? Just before I do that, just one, one point which I'd like to address the earlier question. There's a lot of hidden costs which we just need to be very, very careful with. Just like when coal was introduced in the 1880s, it was seen as a major uplift, a benefit to society. But later on, we found out that there were hidden costs and you know, we're still paying for some of those costs over 120 or 140 years since then. So even with data centers, for example, um, in, in 2018, only 1% 1 of electricity was generated by data centers. But in the next couple of years, it could actually go up to between 15 and 30%. So authorities just need to be very, very careful with their plan just so that they're not actually spending money, but it's gonna cost them more in the next five, 10, 15 years. So always look at the wider picture, the thing outside the box. In terms of Public Social Service and Social Value Act, it does have some constraints in my view from a practical perspective, but before COVID actually took over uh, kind of our lives in many ways, there, there was kind of government kind of plans to actually widen the scope of the Public Service and Social Value Act. So it wouldn't just apply to services contract, but also other types of contracts, especially construction contracts. So I'm hoping that uh, we've had the PPN that's been uh, kind of issued, which applies to central government departments. But as I said earlier, the, the PPN can be, is encouraged for local authorities and other sub-regional authorities to actually implement as well and make use of. There's a lot more work that we need to do. And I have, I have one of our recommendations from SIPFA's perspective in a green paper proposal was that the public service and social value shouldn't really be a standalone legislation. It should actually be incorporated to the public contract regulations to make sure that everybody understands and fully kind of exploits the opportunities. And, and, and as I said, the remit is widened then we'll actually make, take much, much more benefit. But that, as I said, it doesn't stop us doing something at the moment. We can do a lot. It is about structuring your deal to work around the current limitations. And how does it influence your work, David, coming from the private sector in Amy, the Social Value Act? Is that, do you, how do you kind of respond to that? And, and do you kind of go beyond the requirements or do you think it'd be, you know, do you use it to, to bring in more environmental outcomes in your, in your procuring, in, when you're tendering for bids? We've certainly seen a, a big uptick in how that's being used through procurement as well, actually, Hannah. I mean, we've you know been taking that seriously for many years now, but there's an we've started to see a number of authorities, for example, will put social value through higher importance through a procurement process instead of it being part of a quality score, for example, and it being quality and price, is that we've seen some authorities doing quality price and social value. You know, so uh, that driver again through the procurement process it it does it is a catalyst it is a driver to make the private sector really stand up and take notice of what needs to be done but i'd say organizations like what i work for and peer organizations uh, across the sector uh, are doing a lot of fantastic things in this space and again i think it comes down to collaboration and that opportunity in partnerships moving forward is that the outcomes and taking skills as, as an example of that there's so much more that we can do together than mm -hmm. trying to do it separately and even individually through different service streams you can take it up that notch across a, a wider directorate and using as again an example like flexible apprenticeships as a as another example of how you can collectively in a place have a much bigger positive impact in a mature relationship okay thank you um, there's a couple of questions which i think is sort of quite linked so the question do you need a corporate climate change or sustainability strategy in place before updating your procurement strategy or is it the way around what drives which is there a, is there a rule of thumb behind this um could you ex or is it just a case of updating and reviewing your existing contracts to impose uh, new climate change requirements do you have any thoughts on that carolyn what, what comes first is a particular order I do. um ideally it would be good to have the policy structure in place first because that just makes things a lot easier um, and it, and because I think the key thing is here is not um, whether the businesses will do it, that your suppliers will do it. It's more about whether you can convince budget holders to do it. So the more you've got in terms of corporate um, strategy or corporate policy that you can hang um, requirements through procurement on, I think the better. But I, I don't, I don't think um, 
you need that before you can start reviewing your your procurement strategy um, and, and I certainly think you shouldn't delay it too long because some of the contracts we're going into I and mean, some of our big highways contracts are um, really long term you know and, and if we don't do it now then you know it's going to be too yeah. late to a certain degree yeah sure Neil like I think all um, three hands out so I'll go around yeah. so Neil first and then David you should never stop because you don't have a plan but but there's a but isn't there so if you're buying hundred thousand pounds worth of uh goods you know paper paper clips whatever whatever then you don't necessarily need a sustainability strategy if you're getting into a multi-million or even billion 30-year contract around waste or highway services how do you know how do you know what you want from your supply chain of that period unless you've got a very clear understanding of what you want. So you'd be shooting from the hip a little bit. So a strategy for your place produced with others with a very clear methodology that's robust, that delivers the insight into car current carbon impact um, with a clue as to what needs to be different through your commissioning process strikes me as being what you really should have under your belt before you go into long-term procurement. Okay, David. Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, yeah, for me, you need a vision, but the plan should be built up collaboratively with your partners. And that's where I think you'll get the true value because you'll bring in the different ideas uh, of how you're going to achieve it. Going back to that cost question earlier, that's how you can mitigate cost uh, and impact on this. And supply and demand for products that have been on the market for many years in different services that aren't being utilize to drive that change but for me it's all about that collaboration conversation doing it together that's the way to achieve things swifter and more successfully in my mind okay. Mohammed, did you have a hand up because i saw carolyn yeah. had a hand up yeah okay go for it uh, due to the kind of fiscal constraints that we're all unfortunately going to have to experience over the next several years we've only got one bite of the cherry in my view in terms of making climate change work and we must not make the mistakes that we've made in the past with pfi contracts with outsourcing contracts and, and the point which I'd like to raise is about commercial contractual risk transfer. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done by public bodies to really make sure we get good contracts, which, which are understandable, which are achievable. I find that Neil mentioned earlier about 20, 25 year contracts. Do we really need to go into 25 year contracts where we don't know what we're going to do in six months time? And that really produces a lot of kind of tensions between the contractor and, and the public authority. And as David mentioned, collaboration is key to this. We need to make sure we have a win-win situation, not just when we actually enter into the contract, but during the operational phase of a contract. So it's possibly a new type of contracting that we need to look arrangement that we need to look at to make sure we actually everybody actually wins in the end, because society, the UK needs to win in the end. And as I said, we've only got one bite of the cherry now. Mm -hmm. well, I've got mm -hmm. Carolyn, do you want to come in and finish yeah. us off here? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of building on that um, and the vision piece because it, it is really helpful to have the strategy behind you. But if you get too prescriptive with what you're trying to say, then then you have no wriggle room for technology changes or for changes in priorities. But to actually place an outcome, a broader outcome, then that allows um, suppliers to come up with their ideas as how to achieve that, and you're not limiting what they're thinking. So I think we have to be careful that we're not too prescriptive about what we want, but more around that outcome okay thank you well i'm really conscious of time and we have gone over there are more questions but um we'll try and get some responses to those um yes i'm being told we need to wrap up so i'm really sorry we can't take any further questions um but so can i just take this opportunity to thank all the speakers for their fantastic uh contributions and for you and to the people uh on the call for taking part and participating uh, do keep an eye out for further webinars that we're going to run together um, around the same sort of uh, climate change procurement theme. Uh, and in the meantime, have a lovely Easter weekend. I hope you manage to get some time off to recharge your batteries. Uh, even if you are working through part of the holidays, school holidays at least, I hope you get some time off. So thank you all very much once again um, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thanks very much.